This is the first podcast for AP Chemistry. It's for Unit 1, Chapters 1 through 3. So we're going to say that this is AP Chemistry Podcast 1.1, and we're going to talk about measurement, significant figures, and dimensional analysis. So here we go. Significant figures, everybody's favorite thing. Um, why do we care about significant figures? Well, all measurements have some degree of uncertainty. So when we're in chemistry lab and we're taking measurements, we use different pieces of equipment. And the uncertainty of those measurements depends on the precision of the measuring device that we're using. Whether it's an electronic scale, um, a volumetric flask, whatever it is, it has some sort of precision that we need to record with our numbers. So an example that we can look at. Do two different grapefruits have the same mass? Well, technically it depends on what we use to measure them with. So if we look at this, we have grapefruit one and grapefruit two. If we were to use a bathroom scale, it's not terribly precise, it kind of rounds. So on the bathroom scale, it would say that each of them are one and a half pounds. But if we were to come into the classroom here and use the analytical balances that we have, we could see that to a greater degree of precision that grapefruit 1 is really 1.476 pounds and grapefruit 2 is really 1.518 pounds. So do they have the same mass? No. Um, the more precise your measurement is, the more um, numbers, I guess you could say, the more significant figures we have to deal with when we're looking at these. So, in, tar in terms of significant figures, we assume that the uncertainty in the last number is to be plus or minus one, unless it's otherwise stated. What that means, here's an example. If I have 1.86 kilograms, what that really means is I have 1.86 kilograms plus or minus 0 0.01 kilograms. It's this last number right there that gets us, and that's where this kind of uncertainty comes from. So here's a question for you to try. What is the difference between the measurements 25 milliliters and 25.00 milliliters? Well, if we look at these, we can definitely see that the difference is there's a few more zeros tacked on to the end of this one. But if we were to look at that in terms of precision, so what's the uncertainty just like this? We could see that 25 milliliters really means anywhere from 24 to 26 because it's plus or minus one milliliter. And this one is anywhere between 24.99 to 25.01 milliliters because it's this last number that's the uncertainty, so it's plus or minus 0 0.01 milliliters. So this is a much more accurate measurement than just saying 25 milliliters. All right, so in the lab, these are a selection of different pieces of equipment that you can use that will let you measure volume. So these are actually in a specific order. And if we look at them, we know this one over here is called a burette, and it is actually the most precise of everything here for measuring volume. So we're gonna do a sign like that. So the burette is greater or more precise than the volumetric flasks. The volumetric flasks are usually used when we're trying to make up certain concentration solutions. So maybe like a two molar sodium hydroxide solution and we need 500 milliliters of it. We would use a volumetric flask in order to mix those up. They're still very accurate at measuring volume but it's only for one volume. And volumetric flasks are actually um, more precise than pipettes. And this is a glass pipette. We have these in the lab, we'll use them. Usually for very small volumes is when we use them. They're really accurate for that. Um, graduated cylinders are a little less precise than a pipette. And then beakers are at the very bottom there in terms of volume. Not very precise at all in getting you a very precise amount of volume of a liquid. All right. So these significant figures we've been talking about, let's talk about how we count them. This is really, really important. Make sure that you memorize these rules so that we can refer back to them. 
Um, on the AP Chemistry test, they pick a question, one question, one free response question, and they grade it for significant figures. You can miss usually one out of ten points for significant figures. They dock you once for the whole question. So they are looking for them. You need to make sure that you can keep track of them. So here we go. Rule number one. All non-zero numbers are significant. So your ones, twos, threes, fours, those always count. They're always significant. Where it gets tricky is with the zeros. So we have three types of zeros. We have leading zeros, trailing zeros, and captive zeros. Leading zeros are not significant. Ever, never, 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 never. Not significant. All they are are just placeholders. So they're just kind of showing you where the rest of the number should go. Trailing zeros can be significant, but there has to be a decimal point. So for example, if I have 0 0.010, we just talked that the leading zeros are never significant. They don't count. This one is because it's a non-zero. And this trailing zero right here would count as a significant figure in this number because there's a decimal point. But if I were to write another number, let's just say 10, 10 with no decimal point, all it means is I only have one significant figure. My non-zero number is significant, but this zero, which is a trailing zero, is not significant because there's not a decimal point after it. And then we have captive zeros. Captive zeros are in between non-zero numbers, so say I did 101. That captive zero counts as significant, so there would be three significant figures in this number. So leading zeros, never significant. Trailing zeros, only significant if there's a decimal. And captive zeros are always significant. We have exact numbers as the last rule, and exact numbers are counted numbers. So for example, if you um, counted three apples, they have an infinite number of significant figures. You don't think of them. They don't affect your calculations. Um, you just ignore them. So those are your rules, make sure that you know them. All right, we're gonna do some practice with counting significant figures. So we have our examples here, we have eight of them. So if we look at these, we know all non-zeros are significant. So five and four, so that'd be one, two, and then this is a trailing zero. On the previous slide, we said trailing zeros are significant if there's a decimal point, and there is a decimal point in this one. So this would have three significant figures. Number two here is the number 210. 210, we know that two is significant, one is significant, but the zero here is another trailing zero. This time there is not a decimal place, so this guy does not count, which means this number only has two significant figures. 801.5 this is a captive zero, and on the previous slide we said captive zeros always count for significance. So we have one, two, three, four significant figures. The number 1,000, we have three trailing zeros, all without a decimal point, which means that the only significant number is the first one here. So this only has one significant number. Okay, we have .0151. Here's our leading zeros, and we said leading zeros are just placeholders. They do not count towards significant figures. So we would only have these last three numbers as being significant figures, which means this number only has three. Number six is 2,370.0. That point is important because these trailing zeros, yes, this is a trailing zero, even though it comes before the decimal point, still trailing. There are two of those, and since there's a decimal point, it does count as being significant. So all of these, one, two, three, four, five, are gonna be significant figures. So that has five significant figures. Here we have 1.7 times 10 to the third. When you see numbers written in scientific notation, basically you're just gonna ignore this part right here. All we're gonna look at is the part that comes at the beginning. The times 10 to the third just tells us about moving the decimal. It doesn't count towards significant figures. So we just look at the 1.2. Both of those are non-zeros, so this number just has two significant figures. And then in number eight here, again, it's a scientific notation number. We ignore the times 10 to the negative six. That doesn't matter. So we have 9.010. I have a captive zero, 
and captive zeros are always significant, and I have a trailing zero, and this trailing zero has a decimal in the number, so it does count, which means all four of these are significant figures. All right, not only do we want to be able to count significant figures and numbers, we need to be able to calculate with them. So rules for calculating with significant figures. Two different things, we can add and subtract, or we can multiply and divide. When you're adding and subtracting, you're only as good as your least accurate place value. What that means is you can only have an answer that is as many places or decimal places as the least accurate one that you used. Multiplying and dividing, you're looking at total number of significant figures. And that might be a little confusing between the difference of those, but I think as we go along and do some examples, it's going to make some more sense. So grab a calculator if you don't have one, pause, come back. We're going to try some problems. So we have this problem here. We have 32.567 plus 135.0 plus 1.4567. And I got, let's see here, let's get my pen. I got 169.0237. That's the answer that came out in my calculator. But I need to round this to the correct number of significant figures. So with addition, we said it's to the least accurate place value. If I look at these, this has three decimal places, one decimal place, and four decimal places. This is the one that determines what my answer needs to go to because it's the least accurate. So that means I need to round this answer off so there is only to the tenths place here. So I'm going to say that it is 169.0. Since that's a 2, I keep it at 0. It doesn't round up. So that would be the correct answer in terms of significant figures. Going to the next one, we have 246.24 plus 98.3. And as long as I did all my calculations right, we are going to get 344.54. Oh, that is a terrible point. So here we go. If we look at what we had here, what did we put in? We put something with two decimal places and one decimal place. So again, I need to round this so that it is only to the tens place. And since this is a four, that number is going to stay the same. It's not going to round up. So I'm going to end up with 344.5 as the correctly rounded answer to that question. Subtraction is going to work just the same. So I have 1345 minus 658 minus 23.5478. All right, so according to my calculator here, we get 663.4522. So just like we did with the ones before, I look at how many I have for decimal places. This one doesn't have any. This has one and this has four. So what I'm going to go for is matching this one right here where there are no decimal places. So I need to round it and get rid of all of these, which means since that's a four, I'm going to keep that the same, so this is just going to be 663 for my answer. All right, now we're going to move on to multiplication and division. So multiplying, I have 23.7 times 3.8. Um, according to my calculator, we're going to get 90, wow, this is terrible, 90.0. Six. So 90.06. Okay, with multiplication, we want to look at the number of significant figures. So I'm ignoring decimal places. Now I'm moving to total number of significant figures. Remember, this one would have three total significant figures. This one would have two total significant figures. Since that's the least, that's what I want this one to be. So 90.06, I would round to 90. And then going here, I have 4278 divided by 
1.006. And I got an answer of 4,252 and lots of numbers at the end. 4, 8, 5, 0, 8, 9. All right, so if I look at all those numbers, I need to come back here. This one has four total significant figures. This one also has four total significant figures, which means my answer needs to have four. That means I just basically need to take off all the decimals at the end here. So since it's a four, this stays the same. It does not round up, and I'm going to get 4,252 for my rounded answer. To this last one, we need to think of order of operations. So we're going to want to add first and then do the multiplication part. So adding, we get 6.8 plus 4.7. Doing that, you get 11.5. Now, remember what we said. When you're doing addition and subtraction, you look for the least number of, um, basically, the least number of decimals. So since these both have one number after the decimal point, this is the number that we keep. We, that's the one we want to use. So now we're going to take 11.5 and we're going to multiply it by 17.44. And in my calculator it comes out as 200.56. So significant figures and for multiplication and division, I look for total number, and I want the least number of sig figs. So this one has three, this one has four, which means my answer needs to have three. I need to round my number off right here, since this is greater than kind of 50, I guess. This is going to round up, so my answer here is going to be 201. All right. So those are significant figures. We're going to be using them all year long. Um, what we're going to move into now, though, is converting between units. So dimensional analysis reminders. Dimensional analysis, remember, let me go back to my pen here, is just where we set up a table like this, and we use um, conversion factors in order to get units to cancel to get us to the unit that we want. So it's kind of set up in a table like this. Reminders that you need to know. All numbers should be written as fractions. Units should be written so they cancel. And all the numbers on the top are multiplied and all the numbers on the bottom are divided. This is referring to how you punch it into your calculator. So these examples correspond with the reminder above. If we look at number one, it says all numbers should be written as fractions. So 6.7 grams, if I'm writing it in here as a starting value, I should really write 6.7 grams over 1. So even though there isn't a second unit, I need to remember that the grams is really on top with the number, and it's kind of like a 1 on the bottom that we usually just ignore. Going to number 2, we need to remember that when we're doing these units should be written so they cancel. So if I have 6.7 grams and I'm trying to convert to pounds, it's given me the conversion factor I need. I always start with what's given. So I'm going to start my problem with 6.7 grams. And I'm going to put it over 1. And then I have 1 pound equals 454 grams. Well, I have grams and I need grams to go away. So just like if I were to have... Um, 3x times, I don't know, 1 over x, our x's are going to go away. If you have the same thing on the top and the bottom, they cancel just so the same as with units. So if I have 454 grams, I want to put that on the bottom, and I want to put the 1 pound on top. I'll abbreviate that. That way, my grams and my grams go away. 6.7 times 1 divided by 454. That'll give you your answer in pounds because that is the unit that is not crossed out. So let's practice that then. All the numbers on top are multiplied and all the numbers on the bottom are divided. So if I were to set this up, this is the number they give me to start with. I have 143.55 milliliters. And this is a long one. So I'm going to give myself lots of room here. All right, I'm going to put that over 1. 
I look at my conversion factors, and I'm looking for milliliters. So I have liters, gallons, quarts, gallons, pints, quarts. None of those are milliliters. But I know that in the metric system from my brain, that 1,000 milliliters is a liter. Make sure that you're familiar with those conversion factors still. That's a wonderful thing because my milliliters go away. So I have liters. Now I can go up here and I can use this one. I can put one liter, and I don't want to put it on the top, I want to put it on the bottom, is 0 0.2642 gallons. And, oh my goodness, liters go away. So now I'm in gallons. I need to get out of gallons, and it looks like I can go to quarts. One gallon, again, we're putting it on the bottom because then it will cancel with that one, is four quarts. And then I need a little more room, and then I need to get rid of quarts because it asked me to go to pints. So one quart is two pints. All right, so I check. Milliliters crossed out, liters gone. Gallons, gone, quarts, gone, leaving me only pints. That's great. That's what it asked me for. So now I need to plug this into my calculator. If I were to plug this in my calculator, which I do, will do in a second, if I could show you what it looked like, it would be like this. I'm going to do it all in one step. I would take 143.55 times 0 0.2642 times 4 times 2, then I'd go divided by 1,000, and divided by all these ones, they don't matter. So you can see everything that was on top got multiplied, and then I started hitting the divide button before anything on the bottom. So if I punch that into my calculator, 143.55 times 0.2642, times 4 times 2 divided by 1,000. My answer is, get out of there. Oh boy, there we go. Wow, this pen is not working for me today. 0 0.3 Zero, three, four, seven, oh, another zero, seven, but we can see it goes on and on. We probably should look at significant figures here. So because I was multiplying by all of these, I'm going to go by my original number here, and there were one, two, three, four, five sig figs, so I need to make sure my answer has five. So, one, two, three, four, five. I need to get rid of that seven, which means this needs to round up for one. So it'd be zero point three zero three four one. I need a unit so we know what the heck these things are. It's pints. And that is your final answer. Hopefully you can read that because that's terrible. All right, moving on. So just some questions. Pretty simple one. There's only one unit I need to convert. So seven inches. Let's try a different pen here. All right, I have, if I can get a dot, seven inches. So my pencil is seven inches long. What is its length in centimeters? They so nicely gave me the conversion factor. I don't need to remember that. So one inch. That's what I need to get rid of, which means my one inch needs to go on the bottom. And I want to put the 2.54 centimeters on top. This pen might be working a little better than the other one. So because they're both on top, oh, remember to put that over one, we're going to multiply that together. Seven times 2.54 gives us 17.78 centimeters. Oh my goodness, we need to pay attention to significant figures. I go back to this, this guy has three sig figs, which means my answer needs to have three. 
this 8 is going to round up that to an 8, so the real answer is 17.8 centimeters. Okay, so moving on. We want to convert 55 miles per hour. This per really means to, oh no, go back. Oh boy. So this per really means that I want to divide by hours. So this is a multiple unit one. I'm going to have miles on top and hours on the bottom. So when I go to write this, I have 55 miles. Get my little dot there, maybe. And it wants per hour, so one hour. All right. I need to do some converting here. I need to go from miles to meters, and I need to go from hours to seconds. So I am definitely going to need a longer line. Let's start with time because it tends to be the easiest. We have an hour. Well, I can break down an hour closer to a second by going to minutes. I know that in one hour there are um, 60, yes. I can tell time. 60 minutes, and then in one minute, there are 60 seconds. Okay, so this was a good thing that we did here. Our hours and hours are going to go away. Our minutes and minutes go away, leaving me with just seconds on the bottom, which is good because that's where it needs to go in the answer. Okay, the next one I need to do, though, is miles. So if I look at this, there are 5,280 feet in one mile, but I also know that there are 0.621 miles in a kilometer. And I think I'm going to use that one because then I only have to go kilometers to meters, and that seems a little easier. So I said that there were, we'll write it down here, 621 miles in one kilometer. So if I want to use that here, I go back. I have miles on top. That means my 0 0.621 miles is one kilometer. And I know a kilometer is bigger than meters, so it gets the one and there are a thousand meters in a kilometer. All right, my kilometers went away. My miles went away. No matter how far they are, if it's top and bottom, they still cancel, leaving me in just meters per second, which is good. That's what it asked. All right, so here we go. If I want to calculate this, I'm going to have to ignore that, we have 55 times 1,000. Those are the two numbers that are not ones that we have on top. We want to go divided by 60, divided by 60, divided by 0.621. So the answer I get is 24.60 meters per second. And then if I look back for significant figures, this only has two. So my answer needs to have the same. Okay, so this 6 is going to cause this 4 to round up, which means that this answer is really 25 meters per second. And that's your final answer. Okay, so we'll clear that. Move on. Okay, area and volume can be a little tricky because we deal with cubic. Cubic feet, cubic inches cubic centimeters, the cubic is the part you need to watch out for. Whoops, the end, not yet, sorry. All right, here we go. One more problem. We have 6.20 liters over one. Okay, I know that there are 28.32 liters in one cubic foot, so 28 0.32 liters in one cubic foot. Well, great. I don't need cubic feet. I need cubic inches. 
I'm going to ignore the cubic for a second and just think feet and inches. Hopefully we all know that in one foot there are 12 inches. So it's pretty simple actually to involve the cubic. We just have to think that this thing then needs to be cubed and this thing needs to be cubed because I need cubic feet just like this so I need to cube it and then I need to cube my inches in order to get all the feet to cancel. So I'm going to write it the long way. I'm going to say one foot is 12 inches. So if we think of it like that, if I leave it like that, this foot here is only going to cancel one of the three that I have here. That's not good enough. I need to cancel three feet in essence, three feet units. So I'm going to do this again. This is not wanting to do dots or decimal points. And so now I have two feet, but I still have three, so I need to do this one more time. Still not happening. All right, so the cubic feet here is like I have three feet units. That will cancel with these three things here. And that's a good thing because I needed to end up in cubic inches. And if I look at this, inch times inch times inch, I'm going to end up in cubic inches. So this will give me my answer. If I plug it all in here, we're going to take 6.2 times 12 times 12 times 12. And then I want to divide by the 28.32. So we end up with an answer of 378.305, and I'm going to stop there. Inches, 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 x times x times x is x cubed. Just the same thing happens with units. So this is really inches cubed. Okay, sig figs. This guy has three. So does my answer need to have three, which means I'm going to cut it off right there. This three will not change the eight. So my final answer for this problem is 378 cubic inches. All right. We're going to do more practice with all of that good stuff in class. I'm sure you're super excited. And that's the end of podcast 1.1.